Today we're talking to Robert Clark, noted writer and scholar, also director of the Bioagronomics Group. It's an international consulting firm that services the cannabis industry. And Rob is the author of uh, uh, quite a few very interesting books, including uh, Marijuana Botany, and most recently co-author of Cannabis, Evolution, and Ethnobotany, a, a, a tome uh, that represents really life work involving extensive travel around the world, visiting various hemp cultures, cannabis cultures. Rob, what got you into this? Well, I guess it was uh, going to University of California in Santa Cruz in the formative years. And uh, yeah, it seemed an appropriate way to graduate from university, something I was interested in. So I wrote an undergraduate dissertation about cannabis, and it's been, uh, it's been my path ever since. Well, I remember back in the day, uh, back in the 1960s, late 1960s, was when one spoke about cannabis, one heard phrases like Acapulco Gold, Panama Red. Uh, yet when I go into a medical marijuana dispensary these days in California, I don't see those strains. What happened to those great old land race strains? Yeah, those would be like you say, we'd call those land races. Those were uh, varieties maintained by local farmers in, in concert with the natural selective pressures of the local environment and usually selected for a, a particular end use, whether it was uh, for marijuana or for hemp seeds or hemp fiber. And those, those are really what the original marijuana varieties were, the imported Colombian and Mexican and Thai of, of the past. And they were the, the varieties that farmers grew for themselves. Then they became uh, items of trade. And there was never really enough of those to, to fill the expanding market. So pretty soon people grew whatever they could get a hold of. They brought seeds from America back to production areas like in Mexico or Colombia. And then those land races began to disappear. There weren't uh, farmers carefully taking care of them every year, maintaining them. There wasn't such a selection for quality plants anymore. And we've just basically lost these over the years. And, and in terms of the uh, genetic explosion, if you will, starting back in the mid-1970s when people in the states, particularly in Northern California, started to breed uh, with these different seeds from different parts of the world, these different land race mm -hmm. strains. And these became sort of the building blocks for many of the strains that people enjoy today. Absolutely, absolutely. Those, those genes are still there from those land races. It's just not possible to go back and find them in situ anymore, living where they used to in, in those particular assortments of genes that made that land race. But those genes are, as you say, they're, they were the basic building blocks. They were uh, hybridized Colombians with Mexicans, with Thais, with Indians, Jamaicans. All what we think of today as the narrow-leafed drug varieties, the, the true indica, the indica from India, where all these originated. Whether they ended up in Mexico or not, all these varieties started in the Indian subcontinent. And these uh, hybridization caused this hybrid vigor, as we would call it. These were isolated gene pools that came together only after people uh, crossed them, marijuana growers in, a, in the States and, and Europe as well, crossed them and made these hybrid varieties that uh, created situations where the best traits of both parents could be expressed. So you'd have... Uh, large flowers from one parent and early maturation and good resin content from another one, potency from another one. And you've come together with these polyhybrid Sinsamia varieties that we have today. They have lots and lots of uh, ancestors, if you will, lots of parents and grandparents and great grandparents. Well, it would seem that in the process of gaining these hybrids, maybe we're also losing something. If the land race, the original land race uh, qualities and uh, the actual plants themselves are, are uh, being disrupted by the very diversity they help bring about. Sure, mm -hmm. sure. It, it, we've become very uh, narrow in what we've selected. We've wanted uh, plants that had a lot of aroma, a lot of potency, matured early, um, and gave high yields. Mm -hmm. and, and 
a lot of the land races really didn't give us that. That's why we've gone on and, and adopted these these hybrid varieties as being being our uh, standard these days. But if you look at, d despite all the variety we see between a Kush and a Cookies or whatever, th this is really looking at variety amongst a very tiny part of the, the whole cannabis gene pool. Mm. It's leaving out all the hemp varieties. It's leaving out a lot of the... Uh, the wild varieties or escaped varieties that are there, unselected types. And, and we can't really go back and find the original building blocks anymore. So we're kind of stuck. I mean, the genes are there, but they've assorted into what's become popular today. And it's hard to go back and find an original Colombian to get uh, gene combinations from that plant that we've suppressed, that we've selected against for the last 30 years. Mm -hmm. Now, you've been in a, involved in, in assisting a project in, uh, that entails genetic tracking of strains. Right. The Phylos Project, I believe it's based yeah, in Oregon. It's, Maybe you could tell us a little bit about that. What is that all about? Why are you interested in that? This is a project based out of Portland, Oregon. It's the Phylos Bioscience is the name of the company. And the project is the Phylos Bioscience Cannabis Evolution Project. And the idea here is to characterize genetically to look at the, the genome of, uh, of cannabis, the entire genome, but to look at, at different examples. We have, for instance, all the dispensary um, samples, the over a thousand that have been analyzed so far. And they produce, uh, you can look at it as a cluster of data, three-dimensional cluster of data. Everything's a bit related to everything else because of the situation I just explained with the mixing of the basic building blocks. But to, to resolve this and to show what's gone into these modern varieties, we're trying to also find original Colombians and Mexicans and Jamaicans and characterize these building blocks genetically so we can see how they're related to the modern varieties. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it makes an interesting experiment in, from two angles. One is you can begin to see the evolution of cannabis, but we, we also are able to use this model to test whether genomic analysis, whether DNA analysis is really applicable to cannabis, mm -hmm. because we know a lot of the history. We know that Jamaicans and Colombians were combined together to make certain varieties. And if this is not shown by the data we're developing, then we have to reinvestigate the applicability of whether this data is really fit for studying cannabis. Mm. <clears throat> it's a very complex plant. It's uh, unlike most plants, it's outcrossing. There are male and female plants, so mm. it's it's impossible to, nearly impossible to self an individual for a trait that's favorable. Mm -hmm. If you do this, you can do it artificially, but it's not the, the natural situation. And it's also wind pollinated. Mm -hmm. So that unless you isolate plants to keep them from being pollinated by other ones in the, in the neighborhood, then the pollen blows around in the wind. So one, parent can, uh, one plant can be a parent to many, many offspring with very many mates. Mm -hmm. So this is also making for diversity constantly in cannabis. Mm -hmm. And we, as breeders, fight this diversity by trying to narrow it down mm -hmm. to a, a variety that breeds relatively true. But this is a difficult path that it's easy to make cannabis seeds, but it's not an easy plant to breed in a structured um, way that leads to plant improvement, leads to better varieties. And why is it you have these challenges with breeding? Is that some, how does the history of the plant itself relate to that? It's basically it's natural history, just that it wants to be an outcrosser. It's, it's always uh, striving for variety in its mm -hmm. own uh, survival mechanism, if you will. And, and we're, uh, we're trying to narrow that variety so that uh, a, variety, a cultivar will have certain traits. It'll mature in a certain number of weeks and have a certain aroma and a certain cannabinoid content. And yeah, so we're, it's always a, a battle between having enough diversity that the plant is genetically healthy and not terribly inbred, but inbred enough so that it's not just a dog's breakfast of different types in, mm -hmm. in one population. Well, it's an interesting point you make about how uh, the, uh, gene, studying, the genetic, uh, studying the genetics of the plant 
uh, could shed light on the, that very process of gene sequencing the plant. Usually it's thought of the other way around. It's the gene sequencing that's going to shed light on the plant. But now it's an interesting reversal. But let's assume that there is a correspondence there. It turns out what, what um, folks like Mowgli Holmes and Philo's project, John Page up in British Columbia, the fellow out in uh, Colorado, we've got Kevin McKernan out there in Boston doing this very interesting work with gene sequencing the plant. It, let, let's say it, it, the method is validated. So what are likely the implications of that for the cannabis industry, for example? I mean, it's a burgeoning industry, and it's all basically based on this plant, at least right. in theory. Right, right. And, and people have put a lot of energy into developing what they call varieties, or at least... Uh, asexually reproducing a cutting, you know, making a clonal propagation. And once you start to be able to identify plants, to, to fingerprint them, if you will, it's not a totally appropriate term, but to identify them in a, in a physical way, then you have the ability to protect them. The, and the, the initial knee-jerk response is, well, if I can identify these gene sequences that identify my variety that I'm trying to keep for, for my uh, monetary gain, mm -hmm. then like patenting any product or any uh, process, you would begin to think about restricting other people from using your intellectual property, your variety. That's one way to look at it. And that's, that's uh, the way patent applications and processes basically work. The situation with cannabis is a little bit different because everybody, pretty much everybody, has given seeds or given cuttings of their favorite plants to their friends. Well, the minute they do that, they've uh, put their creation into public domain. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's like handing out a your manuscript to your book without having copyrighted it. Mm -hmm. You know, that would be uh, analogous. but. So it is part of the public domain. And what that means is that most of the cannabis that's out there now belongs to everybody. It doesn't belong to any one person. And if someone has something they haven't released, <clears throat> they've kept it proprietary, then it can belong to just them. And when and if there's a system in America to protect these plants, they could be protected. But it makes a lot more sense rather than fighting to keep other people from using something you have to just admit that we all have access to all these things and they belong to the public domain and they can't really be sequestered and used by one party. Mm -hmm. And it would be it's what's being termed defensive intellectual property rights protection. Mm -hmm. You're not on the offense to try to keep other people excluding their use or license the use of your variety. You're just saying that it's everybody's and no one person can take it and profit from it. Mm. And that seems in the current state of the way things are to be a more logical way to approach the, the situation. Although you have a lot of money moving into the cannabis industry now, where I think when IP is considered, it's more in terms of an offensive approach. This idea of defensive mm. IP, intellectual property, is very interesting. And as you say, it may be more appropriate for the realities of how the, the cannabis narrative has unfolded in our culture, and then right. you have this, still the prohibition hanging over everybody's head. Right. So where do you see the future of this going? What, what, what are the implications here? It seems to me that we already have models for where cannabis is probably going. We have a boutique wine industry. Mm -hmm. We have the craft beer industry. Um, people can make their own beer and wine, but very few people bother to do that. They go buy a beer or wine of the price range and quality and, and varietal characteristics they're looking for. I don't see that that would be any different with, with cannabis. But like beer and wine, most people drink mass-produced beers and wines. They, they don't want to afford the better ones. They're perfectly happy with drinking uh, whatever they're drinking, smoking whatever they're smoking. And I assume that based on convenience and things that a lot of the Cannabis industry will be, you know, the convenience industry. Drop by an outlet where whatever it ends up being, a liquor store or a cannabis store or a Speedy Mart or whatever, and uh, picking up 
whatever product you like, whether it be edible or a vape or whatever, that that it's harder really to picture what the the regulatory climate is going to be for this whole thing. It's it's uh, difficult to perceive what the Food and Drug Administration is going to do with a food drug or a drug food, medibles as they're presently called. This is just a nightmare scenario for me. It's it's that medicines were the gateway to getting adult social use of cannabis legalized is fine. That's the path it's taken. But as soon as legitimate established medical factions, companies enter into this, the whole, the whole terrain's going to change. Mm -hmm. You can't say something's a medicine unless you can prove it's a medicine. Mm -hmm. And we just don't have the science in most of these cases to to, to back up what people feel in their hearts is correct, and probably they're, they're right. We have good anecdotal evidence, but we need hard science mm -hmm. on many, many levels with cannabis. We are assuming a lot more than we actually know. So it doesn't quite fit in the slot. If it can be a food or a drug, yeah. it doesn't fit in with a food and drug administration. It has yeah, to be or, not And it's really a healthcare product. Mm -hmm. I mean, why make claims? You know, it's, it's a healthcare product. And if I decide that red wine is good for my heart, which there's plenty of evidence that red wine is good for human hearts, that's fine. But I can't put a label on a bottle of red wine that says, this is heart healthy wine. Mm -hmm. that, that, that's where the, the, the line is drawn, you know? And we make lots and lots of claims that would not be allowed for any healthcare product. Mm -hmm. So it, a lot of the aim with our consulting group is to try to help people pre-comply. Pre it's easy enough to see on a federal level many rules that people are going to have to comply with, many hoops they're going to have to jump through with any product that is a food or a healthcare product or anything of this nature. So it's not so hard to imagine the obvious hoops you have to jump through. What we have to hope for and also try to enter in as much as we can as, as a user group and, and those responsible for our own futures that we don't allow cannabis to be over-regulated. Mm -hmm. It's not any more dangerous as it's turning out as, than many other food and drug products. So why, why should we be subject to more hassles than other groups? That there is no such thing as a zero tolerance for rat poop in peanut butter. You're allowed to have a tiny bit of rat poop in peanut butter. Not enough to make people ill, but you can't say that you can't have any rat poop in peanut butter. That's impossible to achieve. Mm. So we, we don't want uh, goals with cannabis regulation that make it impossible to achieve. You know, it seems that the, in terms of a prohibitionist framework, uh, those that define or have tried to define what that plant is, very comfortable calling it a drug plant in a prohibitionist context. Right. Calling it a drug plant in a medical context, it's a begrudging. And in the framework that you present in Cannabis Evolution and Ethnobotany, um, you speak about drug plants and non-drug plants, the latter being hemp. Um, you don't speak so much about indica sativa in the way that it's folklorically discussed in our own community. Right. Uh, why not? What, what's, the, what's the drawback or the deficiency? Why not uh, speak in those terms that, that people tend to be familiar with? They, you know what, they, they think indicas are a certain, they make you more tired and, and sativa is energetic. You know, what, what is, what's the shortcoming with that kind of way of discussing things? Well, I think it's fine to have these characterizations and, and people, what we're talking about here is this, the study of classifying organisms, or classifying anything. It's taxonomy. And taxonomies, every culture has a different way of doing taxonomy. Every tribal group that names the plants they use for food and medicines have created their own taxonomy in their own language. And often those are descriptive, and those words through the descriptions relate one plant species to another that because of their similar uses, maybe they're grouped together by this, this group. They might not be related in terms of their leaves and flowers and growth habit particularly, but based on their usage. So people have to realize that taxonomy is a very fluid thing. And, and of course it's valuable to name things because then we have a common system and when uh, 
you say you're talking about cannabis sativa, I know you're talking about the same plant that I am, not mm -hmm. some other cannabis or some other drug plant or some other fiber plant. It's all very valuable, but we've ended up through sort of a process of elimination, we've ended up with calling the two different groups, general classes of drug cannabis as seen to me either sativa or indica. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, they're all hybrids between two different groups, whatever you want to call them. We ended up with sativa and indica as the names because up until relatively recently, most taxonomists have, have concurred that all variation of cannabis is part of one species, cannabis sativa. Mm -hmm. Then when Afghan cannabis came along that was markedly different, that was called indica. Mm -hmm. And basically to differentiate it from what already existed, which was called sativa, and it was a drug variety and there were reasons to think that it was another species. That's where the two species debate really began, was when Afghan cannabis came on the scene, late 70s. But before that, people had only seen drug cannabis that came from India. No matter where on the planet it popped up, it had originated in India. And Afghan cannabis was limited just to Afghanistan and parts of Pakistan until late 70s. And you know, did it look substantially different, 70s. these two? Uh, it does look substantially different. It, it's a different general growth habit. It's shorter, more compact, broader leaflets. The Afghani. Uh, the Afghan, and, and darker green colors, shinier, and uh, unique aromas. Yeah. And it matured quite a bit earlier than the semi-tropical. But they're both drug plants, and they said they both, you both use them, they get you psychoactive high. Psychoactive drug plants. Mm -hmm. They both contain THC. Mm -hmm. The narrow leaf drug varieties, what people call sativas, what are the true indicas, indica means from India. Mm -hmm. And when Lamarck named cannabis India, that's what he meant. He meant the, the narrow leaf drug varieties from India. And they've, yeah, they're just entirely different from the, the Afghan varieties, which when they were brought into California, revolutionized the whole Sinsamia industry. It, made plants that were higher yielding, easier to manipulate and manage because they were shorter and they matured earlier. And they had unique aromas and flavors that people initially quite liked, but uh, they're also very high in CBD. It's, uh, all the hashish varieties have quite a lot of CBD in them as well as THC. On average, maybe about uh, the same amount of CBD as THC. And, and we've basically bred the CBD out of these varieties in our modern Sinsamia. And yet today there's a lot of discussion about uh, CBD derived from industrial hemp, as if this is, um, uh, and because of the somewhat arbitrary definition of hemp as being below 0.3% uh, THC, that makes it a hemp plant. Right. Um, uh, there is this idea that somehow the, the CBD dominant plants uh, are not cannabis, they're hemp. Yeah. And, and yet, uh, when you step back and look at it, a CBD plant with 10, 15 percent, maybe 20 percent, like for the ACDC in California, by dry weight CBD, uh, well, it doesn't get you high necessarily, it's still a drug plant. So does it right. make sense to call that hemp? when it's got all that cannabinoid in there, it just happens to be not mainly THC. Isn't it all just drug plants, as you'd say? And that's to me it is, and, it, and their backgrounds are the same too. The ACDC and Harlequin and these things, as far as I know, and I'm pretty sure we'll see in the genetic analyses, they don't have a hemp heritage. They don't have European cannabis sativa in it, or they don't have Chinese Cannabis indica subspecies chinensis, that's what the broad leafed, broad leaflet drug varieties, these are, or uh, hemp varieties. That's a, a different hemp, the Asian hemp, but these are not in the high CBD varieties. They're, I would suspect that the CBD in those comes from Afghanistan. Mm. And they, they are, they were bred as psychoactive drug varieties. It just so happens that they didn't get thrown, that baby didn't get thrown out with the bathwater in this particular case. People, when analysis began <clears throat> on a, a public available level a few years ago, people went back and looked at their different varieties and went, wow, this one has CBD in it, far out. They had no idea, mm -hmm. no idea at all. 
And those were psychoactive drug varieties before they realized that they could use them for something else. So of course they're drug plants. They were, they were bred for drugs. They were selected for high THC. They happened to also be high CBD plants, some of them, mm -hmm. very few of them. And that's what we have today is these high CBD drug producing plants, but the end product is drugs. They're not hemp plants. We're not eating the seeds or wearing the fibers. This is, mm -hmm. so yeah, you have to call them drug plants non-psychoactive drug plants. To me, that makes a lot more sense. Yeah. The point that they, and when we talk about CBD derived from hemp, what are we really talking about here? Uh, if, if, it's a, if it's a plant that has 8, 10, 15, 20% cannabinoids, whether they be CBD or THC, like you're saying, is a drug plant. Right. That's what it is. Right. A, a, plant grow, a hemp plant grown for fiber or for the oil, uh, that's a different kind of thing. And, and, but yet it's been blurred, I think, partly because of this, the green rush toward establishing a foothold in, in the brave new world of legalized cannabis, such right. as it is. Uh, but, um, but anyway, this has been very interesting. Uh, you know, your work uh, going back to marijuana botany in the early 80s has really been, uh, it's really mentored a whole generation of, of farmers who, who I think... Um, these days are in for some interesting changes. Maybe you can comment on what you see in the future for the, the farmers that have carried the ball in places like mm. the Emerald Triangle, doing this kind of breeding, the, this uh, outlaw farming. What do you think the future holds? I think the future for some of these people will be really bright. Bright? But, but they're the kind of people who land on their feet no matter what. Mm. The vast majority of people, I think, are going to be left behind. And that's just because we've operated in a prohibition setting. You know, the, the price of cannabis is artificially very high, and that's because it's been prohibited. It's not particularly difficult to grow. It's easier for the average person to grow now than it ever was. And people who've been involved with this business, especially in California, live in agriculturally marginal areas. They were fine areas for back to the land movements because land was discarded and cheap, left behind by the, by the logging industry. And you see where the bottom lands, they're occupied by, by wineries have been here for 100 years or more. That's where the good land was in Northern California. And the back to the landers ended up with the rest. They've made an incredible go of it. and and. In a way, unfortunately, cannabis has become a key part of the economic picture in, in places like Northern California. And this can't persist. That There's going to be way too many regulations for most people to deal with. It's just simply not going to be worth the trouble. And there will be people who stick with it. They'll be the boutique growers. But you know what? A lot of them are probably going to move to some part of the state that's got better weather if they're really serious about it. And it, it's uh, sad but true. You know, it's, it's the economic uh, settling out of this picture. There's going to be bigger producers, just like there is for everything. So, yeah. I hope everybody adapts as best they can. But, I hope so, too. Yeah. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Good to speak with you. Thank you, Martin.